Okay, so I'm just the sort of host for this event, and I'm going to be introducing everybody and giving you a little bit of their bio so you can get to know them before you hear them reading their wonderful works. Jacob Appel is the author of three literary novels, six short story collections, an essay collection, a cozy mystery, a thriller, and a forthcoming poetry collection. When I read this, I almost had a heart attack, and then I wanted to, like, kill myself because I must be the laziest person on the planet. This is like so incredibly impressive to me. But anyway, his latest novel, Millard Salter's Last Day, was published by Simon & Schuster in November of 2017. So thank you very much and welcome Jacob Appel. Thank you. The good news is if you're thinking of killing yourself, I'm actually a psychiatrist by profession. So um, for, for a very large fee, I will help you afterwards. Um, and despite that lovely introduction to my mother, I remain her son who isn't the rabbi. Such is life. I'm going to read for about ten minutes from this collection, Einstein's Beach House, from the one story with the context that most of my writing remains way below the radar screen. It's a little bit less below the radar screen than others. Um, it's the only story anybody ever asks me to read, and I get lots of angry emails about it, which you'll learn about in a second. So it is a story called La Tristesse de Arisson, which is French, I am told, for the sadness of hedgehogs. We'd been living together for eight months when we adopted the hedgehog. I wanted a German shepherd or a Doberman pincher, a fearless, intimidating animal that could accompany me jogging in the park late at night. Adeline wanted a baby. Neither of us had ever mentioned anything about hedgehogs. But then Adeline read an article on unconventional pets, a throwaway piece in the back of a complimentary airline magazine. And soon enough, I found myself wheeling a four-foot-long glass tank into the service elevator on a dolly. Hedgehogs require their space. It turned out that they also prefer warm, arid climates. So Adeline demanded that we install a convective heater and a dehumidifier in the living room. Outside, it was a balmy May in Manhattan. Inside, our apartment sweltered like the Kalahari. Adeline named the hedgehog Orion. For three days, the prickly little devil entertained us by devouring mealworms and burrowing under aspen chips and exploring a makeshift maze that Adeline fashioned from cereal boxes. According to the Happy Hedgehog Handbook, responsible owners challenge their hogs with intellectual puzzles five times daily. My girlfriend followed the guide's countless do's and don'ts with a fundamentalist zeal. Though I wasn't as smitten with the creature myself, I was delighted to see Adeline in such bright spirits for the first time since her mother's stroke. We didn't argue all weekend, and our sex life rekindled, although Adeline constantly reminded me to keep our volume at a minimum, fearful that an errant moan might alarm our barbed roommate. Actually, the word she used was an alarm. It was traumatized. I could envision her writing me up, just as she does the prospective parent she interviews during her home visits for the adoption agency. Domicile unsuitable for placement. Poor boundary maintenance. Hedgehog likely to be exposed to sounds of sexual intercourse and to be emotionally traumatized. So I screwed like a deaf mute. Sunday was my late night at the restaurant. I co-own a bistro and wine bar with two of my former law school classmates, blood brothers in the fraternal order of ex attorneys and we take turns closing out the register. That evening, I returned home to find Adeline kneeling opposite Orion's cage, guarding the sleeping hedgehog with the intensity of a pediatric nurse. The ambient heat made even minor tasks, like removing my raincoat, feel like hard labor. I kissed the top of Adeline's head. You're up late. Can I ask you something, she asked. Her voice carried an ominous undertone, the same tone she'd used months earlier when accusing me of having an affair. What's wrong, I asked. Do you think he's depressed? It took me a moment to realize that she meant the hedgehog. 
What does he have to be depressed about? I poured myself a shot of warm bourbon from the decanter on the sideboard. He's got it damn good if you ask me. No hawks or jackals to hide from, an endless supply of mealworms and crickets. The varmint has pretty much hit the hedgehog jackpot. I think he's depressed about lying. He looks depressed. I did my connubial duty, placing my face inches from the glass cage and examining the hedgehog at eye level. As far as I could tell, Orion looked no different than he had the previous afternoon. Languid, dopey, content. How could a creature be depressed when his brain was only the size of a kumquat? I'm really worried, said Adeline. Mental illness is all too common in hedgehogs. I read an article online this morning. I tapped the glass. Orion cocked his snout. We could take him back and get another one, I proposed. I regretted the words as soon as they left my tongue. What the fuck is wrong with you, snapped Adeline. If you had a sick baby, you wouldn't take him back and get another one. Good thing we have a hedgehog, I thought, and not a baby. But I had the sense to keep this sentiment to myself. Instead, I attempted to wrap my arm around Adeline's shoulders to comfort her. She shook me off. I can't take this, Josh. I just can't. Not on top of mom's, cried Adeline. If he's not okay, I swear I'm going to jump out the window. Adeline's threat was not an idle one. We lived on the sixth floor. When she thought I was cheating on her last February, she climbed out onto the ledge. After the police talked her down, she spent a week at Bellevue for observation. My girlfriend's father hanged himself in a hotel closet when she was 12. My own mother overdosed on Darbon when I was 14. Sometimes I wonder if a family history of suicide is a healthy foundation for a relationship. But couples have been drawn together by stranger bonds. I know what he needs, I declared, fishing a treat from the jar of freeze-dried silkworms. Orion explored the snack with the tip of his rhinarium and then adjusted it with one swift gulp. I think he's just hungry, I said. For a hedgehog with depression, he's got an awfully hearty appetite. Hedgehog depression is atypical, replied Adeline. The worse they feel, the more they eat. In the wild, unhappy hedgehogs can consume their entire body weight in locusts in the course of several hours. We'll have to keep him on a strict diet and weigh him at least twice daily. Sorry, buddy, I apologized to Orion, but to look on the bright side, Addy, I added, that means more freeze-dried silkworms for us. My girlfriend did not smile. Don't be an asshole, she warned. Adeline insisted we both skip work the next morning. That was easy enough for her. She worked at a nonprofit. But both of my partners were out of town, so I had to reschedule job interviews with three prospective sous chefs and postpone the installation of chandeliers in the upper dining room. Instead, I accompanied my girlfriend to a high-end veterinary psychiatrist who had been featured on the cover of New York Magazine. Dr. Waller's office was located only blocks from the nursing home where Adeline's mother sat expressionless at the end of a musty corridor, periodically calling out lessons she had memorized at his quarters, where she'd once shared a swimming locker with a future Jacqueline Kennedy. Our visits with Adeline's mother were short, somber, and all too frequent. Mrs. Terwilliger had not recognized us since her stroke in March, although she could still recite Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach and several soliloquies from Measure for Measure. That morning, she greeted us by shouting, all gall was divided into three parts. Adeline braided her mother's long silver hair while I sat on the window ledge with my hands in my pockets. My nostrils fought against the faint stench of urine. None of us spoke until we left when Mr. Terwilliger declared, of all three, the Belgi are the bravest because they are the farthest from civilization. By the time we arrived for our appointment with Dr. Waller, Adeline was in tears, and I had resolved to shoot myself preemptively at age 65. Dr. Waller turned out to be a dapper and strikingly good-looking gentleman in his 50s who sported a silk magenta ascot under his burgundy jacket. A matching handkerchief protruded from his breast pocket. The therapist looked more like a game show host than a veterinarian. And when he shook, his, my, shook my hand with a firm, no-nonsense grip, I half expected him to ask if I wished to buy a vowel. He steered us into a spacious yet sterile office. A leather analyst couch sat opposite Dr. Waller's desk. Two upholstered chairs faced the couch, surrounded by a ball of yarn and artificial dog bones and a box of parrot snacks. Along one wall hung the therapist's diplomas, a medical degree from Yale, 
a veterinary degree from the University of New Hampshire, and an MBA from Duke. That was when I realized Waller treated both humans and animals in the same office, which explained his $400 cash-only fee for the initial consultation. Adeline completed a questionnaire while I wrote the head shrinker a check, impulsively jotting quackery on the memo line. Then I inked out quackery and wrote relationship counseling in the margin above. I'll stop there. Thank you.